Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I don't know, this might be a little bit of a challenge, but, um, you know, four, five, six, and seven, you know, for me, they're the big change steps. Um, You know, uh, if not for them, I wouldn't be sober today. You know, I wouldn't be standing up here. I would not be, I would definitely probably be drinking, you know, no doubt, because, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is all about change, right? And um, my sobriety date is January 4th of 1999. so, you know, I'm coming up on 14 years, and uh, in those 14 years, I've never found it, I've never found any time in my recovery, sobriety, um, where change wasn't the central factor of, of, of um, staying sober. My sponsor today loves to say, keep it green, you know, um, and that's what it's about for me. Um, on the way over here is kind of a funny story. Um, I got lost. I thought it was the Winter Circle Group Church, because I think that's Emmanuel Lutheran, but that might be with an I. This is with an E, I'm not sure. And I'm driving a, a, uh, a truck I use for work, which is a diesel, and I was out of, out of fuel, which you don't want to run out with that. And so I'm late. I, oh, and it was a flea market at that church, so I walk in. There's, it's a full packed place. They've got grills going. They're selling stuff. And I'm thinking, what did Chandler get me into? Like, I'm like... I was, like, seriously getting nervous, like, it's the meeting upstairs, and this is, like, to raise money, and I was thinking about the traditions. I was getting <laughs> all thrown out of whack, and, I, and they told me it was a flea market. It was not, I was at the wrong spot. So I leave, and what I learned about Catonsville, I used to live here, I live in Towson now, is that Catonsville has a ton of churches and a ton of gas stations, but there are only obviously, two churches that I needed to find, one the right one and one the wrong one, and I needed to find one gas station with diesel, and apparently that's really difficult in Catesville as well. So I drove around for 20 minutes, finally found one, go inside after I get the fuel, and this little girl, she's about six years old, grabs like a a glass bottle of Snapple, and it shatters all over the floor. And a guy comes out and starts screaming at her, um, and, you know, my first reaction being an alcoholic, being a little hot-headed, um, having defects of character is is to have words with this guy. And he and I exchanged a few pleasantries about little girls in glass and making mistakes and, you know, that kids have accidents and stuff. And But it starts to get a little be a, above your normal conversation. And I start thinking, you're late going to speak about four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> and so I leave and I tell the father who's outside what was going on inside, let him handle that situation. And... um and get in my truck, and, and as I'm pulling out, I just start dying, laughing to myself. I was laughing even harder when I walked in and saw all this. And I was just thinking, you know, this is what it's about. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous for me is about every day. You know, four, five, six, and seven, especially six and seven, uh, as the, I think the 12 and 12 says, it carries on for a lifetime, you know. And it is. It's an everyday, day-in, day-out thing for me. It's a day-in, day-out struggle, and it's a day-in, day-out sometimes triumph, you know. And it's those little moments. It's the little moments where I can sit back and say, is this anger? Is this self-centeredness? Is this ego? Is this fear? And really that started early on when I did my four-step. You know, I like to think of myself or any new alcoholic coming in Alcoholics Anonymous um, as like, you know, when you take out that box of wires, you know, you're trying to find that one charger maybe for your phone or something, and it's just a big ball of wires. (laughs) And you just want to throw it back in there because you don't even know where to start to get it untangled. That's how kind of I feel I was when I walked up to the fourth step, you know, for the first time. Um, I had no idea where to start. But I knew that was the reason I drank, you know, that I had a huge issue. The issue was me. Maybe it was somebody else. Maybe it was the world. You know, it was a lot of things. Trust me, I was very angry and bitter. But I had no idea where to start to even solve that. You know, I'd done one, two, and three. I knew I was an alcoholic. I had found hope in the second step, and I had made a decision in the third. And I saw in the book it said we next launched into vigorous action, but I had no idea what that even meant. And um, thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous that that book's a manual. You know, it's a directions manual. And um, my sponsor told me and sat me down, and my first sponsor, you know, we worked through right down this list. 
my first four step was probably like a really good first step. You know, um, it was a lot of those incidences like at the gas station, except then I would have like knocked over racks of food and thrown over a trash can and peeled out of the parking lot and said a lot worse things. Um, that would have been when I was drinking, how I would have handled that situation instead of walking away and laughing in my truck about it and letting it go. Um, but you know, so it was a lot of incidences like that. And my first four step, quite frankly, wasn't very honest. Um, you know, I, I kind of look at four as honesty, five as courage, six as willingness, as seven as humility. Um, and I look at four and five as change and six and seven as consistency. Um, and for being honesty, I really wasn't that honest. It was just like the war story of the first step, you know. I didn't look at what was behind it. I just said, here's the big old ball of wires, <laughs> and one's red and one's green and one's blue, and they're all in a mess together, you know. And um, my, my first sponsor was my boss. I worked at an auto shop. He was one of the service managers. And so he and I saw each other every day for 10, 11, 12 hours, and we – we just yelled at each other, you know, as, as sometimes that happens in those environments. And um, it was really hard to get together and work steps, you know. And my first fist step, you know, knowing that it was this ball of wires and that it was driving me nuts and I was really having a hard time with it, I knew I had to do something about it. And so I, I didn't do it necessarily right, but I knew I had to get it out. So I drove over to his house one night um, and I knocked on his door and I said, I don't know what to do. I know I have to launch into action. I know I've written down a bunch of crap, and I just need to share it. And uh, and he was like, okay. And so I, I initiated, walked in, and I just dumped, you know. And after that, we read 6 and 7 in the big book, and I was kind of on my way. And the reason I share that is because I did not do it exactly how the big book outlined it. I didn't do it perfectly. I didn't come away with, like, a list of defects of characters. I did it the best I could at the time. And... I'm a big believer that you do AA. You don't think about it. You don't talk about it. You don't analyze it. You don't worry about it. You do it. And you do it to the best of your ability when, where and when you're at, at it. Now, I got 13 years of sobriety. I'm doing it to the best of my ability where I'm at now. And you better believe I work a really hard program because I got a lot going on just as much as I had in my first year. It's just different. Life's different, and life has the same stuff. I have the same stuff I have to write down on my fourth and fifth step, and I do the best I can with it. Um, and that's what I did at the time. Fast forward about a year later, and I knew I had not been honest with this guy. I had told him the worst, deepest, darkest things because he was like a peer, and we worked together, and I held on to stuff. Um, and, uh, and I had another sponsor. And I'm a big believer, too, that you work a tenth step. You work a fourth step in the tenth step and a fifth step in the tenth step and a sixth and a seven. You can always work the steps anytime. You know, any of us can leave here today, go write it all down, go share it with somebody and move on. You know, nothing's stopping us. Um, and so I said to him, I need to do more and um, that some of this stuff was plaguing me. And I think a lot of it was fear, obviously, you know. For me on my fourth and fifth step, a lot of it was fear. And uh, it was fear of what people would think of me. Fear if I admitted it, am I that this type of stuff? You know, am I really that bad? <laughs> Was I really that bad of a person? You know, like I like to just take that ball of wires and put it in a box. You know, I didn't want to really go through each wire, untangle each wire with somebody, and look at it honestly. And that's why it's courage. That's the fourth and the fifth are courage for me. And, um, you know, and, and so we did it. We I sat down. I did a thorough four step out of the book. You know, I listed all the things. I really went through it. I came away with probably three or four things, you know, maybe fear, ego, pride, um, you know, envy, whatever, you know, um, the typical stuff. And I shared with him the deepest, darkest things. And I remember sitting there in a, outside in lawn chairs because that's how he did it. And um, whenever we got together, it was at lawn chairs outside somewhere. Really disarming, by the way. If you have a sponsor who's kind of like flighty and nervous like I was about stuff like that, it's really disarming to be out at a park because you don't even have to look at them. You know, you're like both staring out at the woods. <laughs> and so you feel like you can say a lot more than standing, sitting across from it. Anyways. Um, and I just remember him looking at me and goes, okay, is that it? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And he was like, all right. Cool. It's not that bad. You know, it's not that big a deal. And I swore he was going to just judge me and it was going to be this big deal. And it wasn't, you know. And so, um, you know, we had this list of things. 
So all of a sudden, I went from the third step. I had no idea where to get started, how to do it. I need to launch into action. In my first year, I do the best I can. And here I am finally getting down to the nuts and, nuts and bolts of the situation. And now i got some things to work on. And, um, and that's what we did. And, you know, four and five are important, but everybody knows what those things are going to be on the paper. What I didn't know was that six and seven, to me, the most – maybe the most critical steps for long-term recovery were the where, where the really the rubber was going to hit the road, you know? Because now I got these things, and now I have to do something about them. And um, that's why I like 6 and 7 as consistency, because it's an every day, day in, day out, the little gray areas, the little gray times. It's when my kid's bugging me. It's when I got something going on at work. It's that stuff is where that battle takes place for me. And um, so now I had these things. You know, I was a very dishonest person. I was very prideful, uh, very angry. And I remember thinking to myself, I know in my own power there is nothing I can do to change these things. You know, I would wake up every day and say, I don't want to be this jerk. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I'd come home and be like, dang, man, I was that jerk again. You know, like, like how did I, how did I, I lied about something stupid again, or I did something I didn't want to do, even though I knew you know, self-knowledge, what I needed to do. but I, And that's where my sponsor said, you have to pray to God. This is a spiritual program. You can't do it. It's not an I program. It's a we program. It's a spiritual program. And so that's when I started turning those things over to God in the sixth step, the willingness, you know, to turn it over. And that was really hard for me. I didn't want to let go of some of those things. Some of those things were defensive for me, you know. I like to lie. It was easier sometimes, quite frankly. It was. <laughs> It was, you know, you get caught at work doing something you weren't, might not supposed to be doing. You're late on turning something in or whatever. I just a little white lie. Just it's easier to skirt around it than just say to your boss, "Well, I was, I was being lazy for an hour." You know, I, I had a really hard time facing up to facts, and so that's what six did for me. I, I turned it over to God. I became willing, and then seven is when it really got tough because now I had to be humble, and I actually had to say to myself, "It's me." Most of the time, it's not the world. And I have a choice. And so that's where prayer and humility started to kind of mix together. And it was the first time that I really did believe and see change happen. Um, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'm completely telling the truth when I say I did not think I could be honest. Completely honest. I'm being honest now. <laughs> um, but I remember one day I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking to myself, man, I haven't told a stupid white lie in like three or four weeks. You know, I couldn't believe it. I really it didn't even know it had happened, you know, or I haven't reacted physically angry and thrown something in like two months, you know, and it just started happening because I was praying and turning it over to God. I don't know how it works. I didn't come in alcoholics and I believing in God, but it works. And I'll close with this. Um. It's a lot easier now. In 13 years sober, I, you know, I got, I got lots of different jobs. I went through lots of different experiences. I have three kids now. I have a lot of different life things. And I still work the same four, five, six, and seven because, you know, I have a business. I have a lot of different things that created new defects of character, to be quite frank. Quite frank. Never been in these situation or the experience. It's really easy for those new things to crop up and to not pay attention to them, you know? Like if you, you never own a business or you never been a parent before and then all of a sudden you are those things, it's really easy to just think to yourself pridefully, I'm fine, I'm good. I, I've got 13 years. I don't need to write these things down. i got a handle and grip on it. Not true for me. I have to always stay vigilant. And so now i got a whole new set of six and seven type of stuff to pray about. Um, and that's just the way it goes. And so my box of wires, the ball is so much smaller now, you know. But it's a lot easier if I maintain the wires, you know, and I constantly am looking at them and separating them and figuring out a way to keep them organized. And when I do that, it's not that scary. It's not that bad. I really truly understand my alcoholism. And by doing that, I disarm the fear of ever taking a drink again. So thank you very much for letting me come out here and, and share and I'll pass it on. My name is David. I'm an alcoholic. Um, thanks for sharing. And, um, you know, uh, I, I told you about my, my sponsor, you know, Big Book Nazi. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, so, so I, I, he sent me home to say three, right? So we, we ended with three last session, right? So, so I went home and I said three. The next night, 
The next night, the next meeting, like he doesn't even give me like two days off. The next night he says, did you say the prayer? I said, yeah. He said, he said, are you good with the prayer? Do you want me to say it with you? I said, well, it doesn't hurt for you to say it with me too. So we say the prayer again. And then boom, out comes the book again. Like boom, right? You know, right there on page 64. And he says, Dave, he says, uh, though our decision, meaning the third step, was a vital and crucial step, life-giving, critical to sobriety, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. He said, Dave, so we, we, did the, we did the third step. You with me? I said, yeah, Tom. He said, uh, you went to college, right? I said, yeah, Tom. He said, what does at once mean to you? <laughs> I, I, is it now, Tom? He said, yeah, now. He said, he, so, so what he introduced me to this idea is, you know how you're done three when you're putting the pencil to paper on four. That's the process, right? So, so it, it, it always helped me for him to be very clear on, you know, the, the conditions that existed before taking a step, like the three pertinent ideas before three, and the conditions that must exist before doing the fourth step in this case was, you've said the third step, right? Yep. Okay. I'm going to give you some instructions. You're going to pray and you're going to write. And, and so, again, I was taught right out of the big book. Um, again, I, I'm not, it's not that I'm not a fan of the 12 and 12. One of the things that I found for me personally is that throughout sobriety, I pull things from from the 12 and 12, but the core of what I was taught and, and sort of how I work with brand new people is pretty much right out of the book. Um, and so he introduced me to this idea of, of, a, of an inventory, and it's a written inventory. And there, there's a magic that happens from the things that go on in my head and the way I see them and when I write them on paper. And that magic is so important that it's a, it's a process that, that I have continued um, throughout my sobriety and one that I do regularly. Matter of fact, I'll probably do another one because I got some work situations that it's about time to do a little, a little inventory on and I use the same format. Um, so, so what he introduced me to this idea was, was a written personal inventory. Um, and, and it's supposed to be fearless and thorough. Now, when I was new, you know, um, I'm still got some fear and I'm still not perfect. So I'm not totally fearless and thorough now, but at the time, I was the, you know, I was polar opposite from fearless and thorough. I was, I was full of fear and almost paralyzed by it when I was sober, about two months when I first started taking this on. And so what he introduced me to the idea was that this would take prayer. This, this, that's why he asked me if that third step was solid, is that I would have to go to God. And that's kind of the way my fourth step played out, is that I didn't sit down in an hour. It's my personal experience. I'm sure other people can sit down and write it out in an hour, a day, or a week, whatever it takes. But for me, it was a, a series of, of praying Things coming, writing, peace, uncomfortability, pray, write, peace. It, it, it played out over probably about a month. He, he set a date for me on five, which made it easy. There was a spiritual retreat coming up at a place called Manresa, which is down on the Severn River right across from the Naval Academy. And he said, Dave, he said, I've never been on a spiritual retreat before. I had no idea what that was about. But he said, there's a retreat coming up in about a month. He said, that would be a great place for you and I to do your fifth step. We'll have some time. It's a beautiful place. It, it, it'll be, you know, it's fall. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be really picture perfect, and we'll have some quality time to go through and and share, and we can look out the river and not have to like sit across from each other in the Denny's yep. and do it. You know, I mean, it, you can do it that way if you have to. You know, the tac the tactical fifth step, but it's nice if you can do the beautiful, you know, scenic. Don't have to quite look at each other fifth step. And uh, so, 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 so he pulled out, he pulled out this instructions, and he, and he went through them out of the big book now. What I'm going to tell you right now, and some people may, you know, have a fit with this, but you know what I love right now is there is some great material on the Internet, right, that are, that are worksheets. And if anybody wants them, happy to give them to you. I've gone through them. They are right out of this book, right? So, so what I do now with guys I sponsor is I say, read this part, and then here's your sheets. Fill them out because the instructions are right out of the book. So the first list he had me do was resentments, and he said it's the number one fender. It kills more drunks than anybody, than anything else. So I had to make this list of resentments. And there were four columns in that list of resentments. And, you know, they got them right here. Who are you resentful at, right? You know, why are you resentful at them? What part of yourself is threatened, right? And we see the, the Mr. Brown and Miss Jones example. Personally, I think Mr. Brown's a real ass, you know. I think he should, you know, try to get my job after my wife. I'm looking at this going, man, I want to go get Brown right now and kick the shit out of him. You know, and, uh, and my sponsor was like, no, 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 that's just an example. Dave. I'm like, well, Brown's a real ass, you know, I'm going to Anyway, sorry. But there's a fourth column that you don't see in the example, and it's in the words. And, and, and the fourth column in that resentment list is, you know, not only who am I resentful at, why am I resentful, what part of self, what's my part? How was I to blame? Did I step on the toes of my fellow and they retaliate? Guess what? Oh, yeah. 
So, so one of my best ones in that, so I'll give you an example of one. It really is it's almost like a Mr. Brown example. I had this best friend, Jeff, in high school. I mean, we're best friends, right? I'm drunk one night, and I find out from another friend that Jeff slept with my high school sweetheart. I mean, I've been with this girl for like three years at a time. And I didn't know this. It happened like a year ago. I didn't know about it, right? And so I'm resentful at Jeff, right? You know, what's the cause? He slept with my girlfriend. She, he didn't tell me. She didn't tell me. Nobody, and everybody knows except me, apparently. You know, what's it affect? It affects it all, baby. You know, it hits self-esteem, it hits pride, it's emotional security, it's my, it's in my ambition, and it sure as heck is my sex relations. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a full, you know, full suite, you know, of, uh, of, of hitting me hard. But where was I to blame? Because if we stop there, I'm about ready to take a bat to Jeff, right? Where was I to blame? Hmm. Yeah, I was drunk one night in a blackout at a party before all this happened. And guess what? Jeff's girlfriend happened to be there. And, uh, and I slept with Jeff's girlfriend. <laughs> so now all of a sudden it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Right? Why would my girlfriend sleep with Jeff and why would Jeff sleep with my girlfriend? Well, to get back at me because I started the ball rolling. Those were the kind of things. That, in my head it didn't look that way. But when I wrote it down on that paper, uh, the other thing I'll say about the resentment list, and this isn't true for everybody, but because I had been beaten so up, beaten up so much in AA you know, by my own hand over the years. When I got to you all, there wasn't a lot of people on the list. There was a lot of me on the list. You know, there was that inward resentment at, at, at me because I was just so broken, and I knew it was all my fault, and I, and I just had no idea what to do about it. So I was just full of that shame and that guilt. And so for me, a lot of, a lot of the resentment list at four was, in, was, was inward, and it, and it was having to write down how much I hated myself and who I had become. Through my alcoholism, it's not true for everybody. Some some men I sponsor, I, I find that it's still very much outward projection. You know, it's everybody else is why they are. They're very much in that victim mode. But for me, I'm, and I'm, I feel fortunate that by the time I come in and out for three and a half years, I knew it wasn't other people. I knew it was mostly me with a few other names. Um, so the resentment list was one. The other was next list was the fears, right? And uh, you know, there's another sheet for that. There it is. Fears. Why? Am, what am I afraid of? Why do I have the fear? Which part of myself? have I been relying on, which has failed me? You know, what part of myself does the fear affect? And then we ask for the fear to be removed, you know. So I listed the fears, you know. And I had all kinds of fears on there, you know, fear that I'd, I'd drink again, healthy fear, you know. Um, fears that, you know, fears that I'd never be able to be in a relationship with a woman. I'd never be able to be a faithful partner in a relationship, you know. Fear that, fear that you know, people I love would die and I wouldn't, and I'd drink again. You know, fear, fear of, of never, never being able to work. You know, I mean, I, I have the fear list, the first fear list. And I tell you what, if, if you save your fear list, man, it's really one of the reasons I like saving my fight. I got a whole collection of them at home, and I don't really care who reads them. You know, it, it's, just, it, it's all kind of out there anyway, um, is to see the progress. You know, to look back at that first fear list that was 22 years ago and go, my God. You know, some of those fears came true. You know, I buried people I love, but you all taught me how to do that and walk through that fear. You know, and I remember, I remember uh, hearing Nancy share actually when her daughter was, was uh, becoming one of us, and it was really hard. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death. And people keep telling me the answer to fear is faith. And she said, but, but I can't get there. She said, I really think the answer to fear is to, is to take your hand and, and let God help me through it if I've got that right. But I remember that. And so sometimes today when I face fear, it, it, it's not that I can just muster up my faith. You know, it's, it's sharing it with you all and letting you all help me ca carry me through it. You know, and that's, and that's sometimes what I have to do because sometimes it seems like the way my God works is through your hands and through your heart and through your love, uh, more so than some kind of inward, you know, strength. And, and there's a bit of both, but, but it, it comes a lot to me, to me through you all. So I'm really grateful for that. So, so I made those fear lists. And, you know, and again, they, they fell into categories that I call kind of rational, reasonable fears. And, 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 and they fell into some fear categories that I could do something about. You know, one of the things that happens for a lot of guys I sponsor early on is, you know, I'm afraid I've got, you know, HIV or, you know, or an STD or, or that I'm going to die tomorrow. I said, well, when's the last time you were at a doctor? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, you know what? Go to a doctor, right? I mean, you can take some action to find out whether or not you you're really going to die tomorrow, or is it just a, a senseless fear, right? You know, so simple things like that. I'm afraid that, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to, you know, go to back to school. Well, have you, are you doing anything? Are you, well, no. Do you even want to go back to school? Well, 
I don't know. You know well, why are you afraid of something you're not even sure you want to do? You know, pray to God. See if that's what he wants you to do. And if so, there's other people here we can, we can share our experience with what it's like to go back to college and sobriety, you know. Um, you know, so, so those are the kind of things that I learned through, through, through sharing that fear list the first time with my sponsor and then having a chance to do it many times with men I sponsor. Um, you know, the third list is, is sex conduct, right? And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, again, there's a sheet for that, right? So it's nice. Um, you know, so, so, you know, kind of, you know, who, you know, kind of who was it, you know, what, what happened? Um, what's the exact nature of the wrong? What are my faults? How, you know, was I, was I selfish in that? Um, you know, did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicious resentment, you know, those kind of things? Um, who did I harm? You know, so I had to go through the names on the list of the, and, and, and again, it's really putting it to the test of was it selfish? Was I using people? You know, um, and, and then what should I have done instead? And one of the things that, you know, because well, one of the things I thought, think is just, you know, terribly ironic is that the sex part's on page 69. You know, I mean, it, you know, that says, you know, where else can you get that? And then, you know, I got, I got to do this. You got to give me a minute to do this. You know, I know many, I know many of you have heard this, but, but it, it's classic AA, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, so, so the, the, the typical, and, and, and I, it, you had to do this right, it has to be a woman, so it's better if it's Nancy telling it, but I'll tell it as it is. So, so, you know, so there's a, there's a woman goes to her sponsor and says she's, you know, she's having, she's having, uh, trouble with, with, with sex relations and, and wants some guidance and her sponsor tells her to go to page 69 and she thinks she, she means 96. And so here's what it says. So this is what the woman reads. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. <laughs> Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with ignorance what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, you got to be careful how, you know, if you superimpose numbers in your head. Um, but, but really, I think kind of the core of the sex inventory for me was, was two things. One of those deep, darkest secrets, right? And you know what? They're so common now that when I do a fifth step with a guy and I go, hmm, before we even get started, let me drop out about five or six of my deepest, darkest secrets. Just, we'll just throw them out there. And then uh, and I'll watch them look at their list and they'll go, hmm, yeah, okay, well, since you brought that up, I just had this happen like a month ago with a, you know, young punk kid who thought he was just, you know, really too cool and tough to kind of admit a couple of things to him. And I said, yeah. He said, well, since you brought that up, I've got, you know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. Guess what? You know, it's in the dictionary. You know, someone's done it before you. Um, you know, there's even a second meaning. You know, it, it's not a big deal, right? You do an Internet search on it, you'll get a 1,000 hits, you know, with, with images, right? You know, I mean, so, so you know, so, so this, this stuff that we have that, we, that separates us, and it's that deep, dark secrets that separate us. And what I found is from a, from a beautiful woman named Virginia o, is she talked about the fifth step de-uniquing her. And so what happened when I listed those things on paper and then later shared them with the sponsor is it took away the power to separate me from you. Remember I was talking about the first word of first step? We Guess when I got it? The end of five. I didn't really believe I was quite like you until I shared with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous, my sponsor who was 40 years older than me, like my grandfather, exactly who and what I was and what I had done. And it wasn't pretty. You know, he didn't judge me. He loved me, you know. And there was a great power in that. And, uh, and so I made those lists. And in the, in, the, in the other part of the sex idea, I kind of jumped ahead for a second there, but it's the deep, dark secrets. And the other part of it is who do I want to be? Who do I want to be in a relationship? And uh, I came in here single. And uh, I'm not single today. So I can tell you there's progress, right, you know? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and many of you know my wife, April, and, you know, we've been married for, um, for 17 years now and together for 18 and a half. Um, so, so we've got, you know, we've got a, lot of, we've got a lot of time under our belts being committed to each other. And, uh, and, but it took me a couple of years. It took me about almost four years to find her, right? And so in that four, four years, guess what I'm doing in AA? Everything, you know, with everyone. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I mean, it's true, right? I mean, i got to be honest, right? I mean, they, they talk in here about, you know, the straight pepper diet, right? And, you know, my, you know, we've got some shirts that we ought to get made up for our sponsorship family to say straight pepper diet, right? Because, it, it, you know, if, if, if you give up drinking, the next thing's sick sex, right? I mean, that's to me, is like fills that hole, right? Kind of a poor analogy. But anyway, um, but <laughs> took you a minute, but you got it, all right? I was ahead of you. Um, and, and, and so, and so... It's one of those areas that what, what it was for me was a continual refining of the ideal. You know, initially the ideal was anyone who's willing, right? You know, doesn't matter. You know, if they're willing, I'm up for it, right? And, and then it began to kind of get into when you start 
Okay, well, wait a minute, though. They said they were willing, but now they're crying. Maybe there's something that I'm not being honest about. Maybe I'm hurting people. Maybe I'm misleading people. Okay, well, maybe I shouldn't even be dating that girl at all because she doesn't really match up with the ideal anymore. Oh, okay, maybe I better go to God and pray about this because I can't do those things anymore, right? And it was a process. And what happened was is that when my wife showed up, it was four years of doing that ideal over and, and learning through painful, painful experience. She would not have chosen me as a partner to share the rest of her life with if I had been the man that she met when I was one year old. You know, so it's a process, but it, that, it takes that written inventory again, you know, of what is it that I'm looking for? Oh boy, I just got out of a relationship. Here's a couple things that I sure don't want to repeat. But boy, here's a couple things that I see in myself that I sure don't want to repeat either. And so we began to refine that ideal. And, uh, you know, in five, um, you know, in, in, in five, after I had done that ideal, and there's a harms list too, which kind of comes back to nine. So we'll, leave, we'll push that off to nine. So the idea is after you're done the three lists, you also make this harms list that you'll come back to in the eighth, in the eighth and ninth step. Um, and then I had to go share it. And, and so I'll just jump ahead to, to real quick the fifth step promises because, um, because for me, um, this is kind of really where, where the rubber meets the road. So there's a, there's a condition before the fifth step, and it warns us that if we hold back, we may not overcome drinking. So it tells us, like, don't, don't skimp on this. If you skimp on this step, if you hold back the deepest dark secret, you might drink again. So take this really seriously. And I knew that. I was scared. Going into the fifth step, I was afraid of, of, of holding something back because I knew I'd drink and die. And there was also some hope because I watched men take it a month or two before me and watched them change. So there was fear and there was hope. And I, and I met with my sponsor on the shores of the Severn River, and I spent three hours with him. And this is what I experienced. It's right out of um, page 75. We pocket our pride and go to it illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. Here's the fifth step promises that you hear about sometimes. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have the spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We fear we are on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. I tell you what, man, I'll take those over the nine step promises any day, any day. I didn't, you know, and I didn't realize that's what happened. You know, I walked away and I knew I felt I felt like something had dropped, something had fallen off my shoulders, a weight had been lifted, and I knew I was loved, not judged, and I had been completely honest with another man. But over a period of a couple of weeks, I got news. And, uh, and you know what, I, I kind of get them renewed when I do a fifth step with, with, with men that I sponsor today, and I've been honored to do that with, I don't know, hundreds of men who share with me their deepest, and with confidence. And I don't know my sponsorship family that I trust has ever been violated, ever. So we take it seriously and we help one another. Um, and then they get down to, you know, what next? You know, don't get a break, right? Then he gets an hour here. And my sponsor is right back out with that book again. We didn't even get done. He said, go, go up to your room. He said, we're at the retreat. Right? He says, take an hour and then go on and say the prayer, you know, make sure you're willing. You're saying two paragraphs in six and seven, right? I mean, they're really very short, right? Um, are you willing? And then say the prayer. And so I was willing and I said the prayer. Now, you're right, you know. 12 and 12 says 6 and 7 separate the men from the boys and the women from the girls, you know. And the, on the spiritual path, they call it sanctification. You know, we call it spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection. Mm -hmm. But what this means is when you commit to this path, this is a spiritual path. And what this means is there will be a process through the rest of your life by which you're continuing to look at yourself and continuing to ask God to remove those defects of character which stand in, your, in, in, stand in the way of your usefulness and effectiveness to him and to others. Not the ones you personally want gone, but the ones that stand in the way. There are some defects that I've had that have, you know, claw marks and teeth marks, and I think they're, you know, they've been nailed into the fabric of who I am. And those are some of the greatest assets that I've had in working with new men because I can share with them, oh, you've got that. Well, you know, I've made some progress, but I've still got it too. And I've watched some of those go away. I've watched some of them go like that, and I've watched some of them, man, it takes years of prying them loose. But God has to do the work, you know. In 6, it says, we're entirely ready to have God, not Dave, remove the defect of character and then humbly ask. And there's great power in humbly asking, um, you know, and, and I'm not the best at humility. It usually comes through pain, 
It's a touchstone of spiritual growth for me. Um, and so I give, I, I give God things besides my alcoholism, little bit by little bit. It's kind of like this piece of paper. Here's the way I give God my life, right? I say, all right, there's alcoholism. You can have all that. I got this one. A little bit of sex, a little bit of work, being a husband, being a father. So I've got this. You know what I mean? That's the way I do it over 20 years, right? And if, I've always got a piece in my hand. But there's less than there was yesterday. There's a lot less than there was 20 years ago. So with that, I'll say, you know, what follows that step is, guess what? Next, we launched out on a course of action. <sighs> without which we find that faith without works is dead. So again, there's more work to be done. Over to you, Nancy. <laughs> I know how you feel, Kristen. <laughs> I'm still an alcoholic, still Nancy. Um, I love four, five, six, and seven. <laughs> Absolutely love. And and I, when I was sitting here, I was thinking, you know, we're sitting here and we're laughing, and it's funny about four, five, and six, and seven. And for the longest time in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was petrified of doing the fourth step. I I had the directions, and just like. It was so funny, three of your speakers went to the different church this morning because <laughs> we I didn't follow the direction. I read them in the book and said, yeah, I got this. So when I got when I got done doing my third step with my sponsor and, you know, my sponsor did the third step with me on on our knees at at our house and had the big book and and set off to go do my fourth step. And very much like Evan shared was I, I just I couldn't figure out where to start. Like, I read the stuff about Mr. Brown, and unlike Dave, who wanted to go meet, beat Mr. Brown up, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, what does this have to do with me? I don't know who Mr. Brown is. I really could care less about Mr. Brown. So that's the approach I took. And I just got confused. So I got all the different four-step guides that were known to man at the time, and I am going to do the absolute perfect four-step. I'm not scared of doing the four step. I just want to get it right. So I have this guide and I have the big book and I got the questions out of the 12 and 12 and I've written them all down and I've put those in the columns and, you know, so I'm going to do like the best four step ever that, that anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous has ever done because my motivation is I'm petrified of drinking again. I absolutely positively under no condition do I want to go back to where I was just a few months ago. And I'm scared to death that I'm going to drink again, so I'm going to get this four-step right. And I knew it had to be searching, and I knew it had to be fearless. Um, and I'm just scared. And so I absolutely confused myself to no end. I'm, like, going through these guides, and they don't make sense. And, you know, I heard someone share, you know, I'm looking for my inner child. And someone else said, if I find that inner child, I'm going to kill it. And, you know, <laughs> And I was just, I didn't know what to do, so I just, I took pen to paper and I started writing. And I, and I wrote, bleh, just threw up all over the pages. And then I made the appointment and I went to my sponsor and I shared that. Um, I got a whole lot out of that first experience. Um, but what I really got a whole lot of was when I just really followed the directions exactly as they were outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Kept it simple, didn't analyze it. When it talked about resentments, what I, what I learned by going through a step study guide with a group of people when I was a couple of years sober after I'd already done a four step, I went through this step study and it was a guide written by Dr. Paul. It was an unofficial guide through the 12 steps and it broke the four step down for me, out of the big book, I don't know about you, my sponsor gave me the assignment and sent me off on my way, and I felt lost. I felt like I was in this massive forest with absolutely no direction, GPS wasn't invented, and I can't read a compass. And I don't know what direction to go. With this group of like 30 people that sat down every week for 26 weeks and did the steps together, this guy told me, Write down a list of your resentments, and that's all I had to do was write down the resentments. I didn't have to think about anything else. It also taught me through that process, because by this time I have a new sponsor, and she said, Nancy, just very similar to Dave's experience, sit down, have a conversation with God. 
tell God why you're there. Invite God into the process. You've just turned your will and your life over to the care of God. Maybe it's about time you started asking for his help. Because you can't take care of someone if they don't need, they need, if you don't know that they need your help. When I'm sick, my husband cares for me. I say, honey, can you get me some soup? You know, can you help me to the bathroom? You, whatever it is, I'm asking for him to take care of me. And God wants the same thing for me in the fourth step. So I have to invite him in in order for him to know about my life, to care about me. So I ask God and tell him while I'm there, say, yo, dude, <laughs> I got to do this four-step thing. Uh, somebody ho- didn't holler at me. They corrected me about my reference to my God being dude. And I clearly know the big book says a God of my understanding. My God's a dude. <laughs> it works for me because those are the conversations I have. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like I've got to write this stuff down and I don't know where to start. You know, if you could help reveal to me what my resentments are, I'd be really grateful. And just put the pen to paper and start writing. And then I got the next column. Okay, why do I hate all these people, institutions, places, things? What is why? What caused it? And and I write all that stuff down next to the person. And then I get to the third column. And how did it affect me? And, you know, my sponsor shared with me and those people shared, if you don't know, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out together when we talk about it. Because I couldn't figure all that stuff out. I don't know what pride is. I don't know what insecurity. I mean, I know, but I, I can't make that correlation. And I need somebody else's guidance to help point that stuff out to me. So I did the best I could. And then when we got to the fourth column, you know, um, where was I at fault? Very much like Dave's experience. It was easy for me to see. And, and yeah, there were some things that I wrote on my list that I truly felt that I was a victim. I truly, truly felt that I was a victim. And it took some, some strenuous effort for, with my sponsor and talking through things to really find out that I played a role even in the situations when I was a victim that I played a role in that, and there were things that I could have done to change the circumstances of my life, and I wouldn't have had to continue to be the victim as long as I was. And that was huge for me. You know, and then when we got to the fears, I, was, I, I, I still have some of the same fears I had when I wrote my first fear list. You know, and I've shared this before, I'm afraid of the dark, and I don't know when that fear is going to go away. I still sleep with a nightlight, and I'm okay with that. God knows why I'm afraid. I can't have the room to my bedroom door closed. I'm still afraid of stuff like that. And I'm okay with that. But those fears don't rule my life. Where the fear used to rule my life, and like Dave shared, I know exactly what he's talking about when I shared Bowie Speakers a little over five years ago. In December, and we had just got done putting my 16-year-old daughter in a treatment center. I was petrified for her, scared to death, terrified, because I don't know what the outcome of that's going to be. I know what alcoholism did to me. One of my greatest fears, you know, I already told you I gave up a daughter, you know, when she was five years old. I gave up custody of her. I didn't know I was defending my right to drink. Now I'm sober a few years, and I have another child, and she's 16 years old, and she's overdosed, and I've put her in a treatment center, and I can't see her for 30 days. And I was so pissed at God, so full of fear. What's going to happen? And fear and faith, people say they don't coexist for me. For me, they do. I'm living in fear now. I have faith. Things will work out. It doesn't remove the fear. Sometimes you just got to stand and be afraid and say, please help me. Please help me. You know, and that's what I'm doing. Saying, I can't do this alone. It's it's killing me here, God. I know I'm I know what the fear is. I know it. It's right there. And I got them claw marks, (laughs) you know, going come on, take it. No, 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 no. You know, and it's like, you know it, but walking through it is very different, you know? And then when I got to the sex inventory, you know, for you guys, it was great. You got notches in your belt, but I feel like a four letter word that I'm, I can't say from the podium. 
You know, it might have been great for you and it might have been ha ha funny, but the things that, that I had done when I was drinking, women don't do that. They make me feel like a piece of garbage. I'm worthless. No man is ever going to want me. I'm dirty. That's what I came to my, my sex inventory about. You know, I came full of just garbage. You know, I don't know about you, but the things that I had done those three years that I didn't have a home to live in, the way I had to make money, and the things that I had to do were horrifying for a female alcoholic. And I know there's really no differences because guys do it too, but it's just different. It just is, <laughs> you know. Women want me, not women, I'm not going to generalize. My experience is I want to be pure. You know, I want to be looked at like a lady. And I was nothing like you see today, you know, when I was out there. And that was really difficult for me to put on paper. And I was petrified to share that with another woman. And what was she going to think about me? You know what I mean? Like... You just don't talk about that stuff, you know. And the things I came to next to, quite honestly, had been marked and tagged by animal control. And I just, it was horrifying, you know. But, but just like Dave said, it's in the dictionary. They did not have to come up with a new word for the things that I had done, nor the places I had done them with or who I had done them with. All of it is somewhere else in the dictionary. I can look up everything I've ever done in Webster's, you know, and it was just being able to share that with another woman and not be judged and not have her go, oh, really, you did that? Oh, my God. Like, my sponsor didn't do that. Honest, she fell asleep. <laughs> It was like we're sitting there and I'm sharing this and I look over and she, you know, that, that nodding like when you're in a business meeting and I was like, this is the good stuff, you know, but, um, but it was good. And when I got done my fist step and I share this with all the women that I, that I sponsor is my sponsor had me burn my written four step. And I had read on in the big book and it's just like, <laughs> but don't I need this later? <laughs> But what I got from that experience is when I'm sitting there watching all those pages turn into ash and go into nothing, I realized the greatest absolute gift that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me that day, bar none, not a single gift I've gotten measures up to this one, that I absolutely no longer have to be the girl that I'd written about in those pages. I did not have to own her guilt anymore. I didn't have to act like her. I didn't have to look like her. You all gave me the opportunity to truly be whoever and whatever I wanted to be. If I chose, I could continue to live in some of that stuff and act like some of that, but I didn't have to. And that was the greatest gift Alcoholics Anonymous gave me. And that's why I share that with other women. Not all of them choose to burn it, and that's okay. It's their experience. I don't force my experiences on them. I share my experience, and this is what I suggest. This is what happened for me, and this is my experience. And I love that Dave read those fifth step promises because those came true for me. You know, and then I followed the directions, and I went and I sat for an hour, and I believe that's probably the most important part of the fifth step is taking that quiet hour and reviewing the first five proposals. Is our work solid so far? That foundation that Dave talked about, that's what we're building. And I had to ask myself, was there any reservations about my first step, my second step, third step, fourth step? You know, the last thing that my sponsor did, and, and I do it with the women that I sponsor when I'm listening to a fifth step, is after everything is said and done, she's like, okay, what else? What is the one thing that you're petrified to share with me? Is there anything that you haven't put on this paper that we need to talk about? You know, I haven't yet have a woman come back and say yes. You know, and then after the hour, my sponsor did the same thing. Is there anything else in that hour that came up that you've thought about? You know, and I could say no. And I was really confused about six and seven. 
terrified. I mean, I just didn't know what to do. I had written, I went home on my own, wrote down all my character defects, and I think I had like 2012, you know. So I write them all down, and I take out Webster's, and I want to emphasize this is without guidance of a sponsor. This is my own plan, my own, Nancy's plan. And I write them all down, and then I define them all. <laughs> and then I figure out what the opposite of that character defect is, and I look those up, and I define all those. And so every day, I'm going to work on a different character defect, and in a couple of years, we'll be done. <laughs> That's the approach, I, because the big book didn't give a whole lot of guidance and direction, you know. So my husband, who I've, I've met when I was three months sober, he, he watched all of this, and he experienced some of it. So, okay, today is the day that I'm working on. We're not going to be angry. Okay, this is the non-angry day. And I go through the whole day, and I'm not angry, and God rocks, and I'm like, thank you, God, you took away anger, you're awesome. And then he and I go out to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous together. It's a room just like this, and he's sitting right here. He doesn't look left, doesn't look right, doesn't look behind him, nothing. And I'm sitting next to him, but I see all these beautiful women in the room. We're on our way home from the meeting, and I said, I know you were looking at her. You like her better, don't you? Her hair is prettier than mine. <laughs> I saw you looking at her legs. You were checking out her chest. She's got a bigger chest than mine. Don't you want to be with her? Go ahead. Be with her. You can have her. I don't want anything to do with you. And he's looking at me like I've got 12 heads, you know. And I'm sitting there. I've heard nothing in the meeting, but I have him dating her, married, three kids, a new house. I'm homeless again. And he has done nothing but listen to the speaker. But guess what? I'm working on anger today. <laughs> so what I figured out is that Nancy can't do this. And then I go share with my sponsor what I'm doing. And I'm like, this seven-step stuff just isn't working, you know. And, and she just, she laughs, you know. She's like, Nancy, that's not how the seven-step works, you know. It's about just bringing all of you to God. You can't pick and choose what parts of you are good and what parts of you are bad. Let's look at the prayer in the book. So we look at the prayer in the book, you know, and then she did direct me to the 12 and 12, which I absolutely love for steps six and seven, because in there it, it describes me. It tells me that everybody is born with an abundance of natural instincts, an abundance of them. And if there's anybody in here that's a parent or has watched a child, you get it. Like when my daughter was born in the little girl, she's 22 now. Um, when she was born, I didn't sit down and say, okay, Courtney, I want to teach you how to lie, manipulate, steal, and cheat your way through life. This is how you lie better. But you know what? When she's three years old and it's just me and my husband and her in the house and that glass is broken and I say, what happened to the glass? I don't know. <laughs> well, did you drop it? I don't know. I didn't teach her to lie. I said, I would say, it's okay. You could tell me the truth. It's no big deal. You're not going to get in trouble. Just, I, I just curious what happened to the glass. I don't know. And that's, I did that too. I did that my whole life. I instinctually knew how to preserve myself, lie, cheat, and steal, manipulate to get things to be my way. My parents didn't teach me how to do that. They gave me good values. Add alcohol to that. And I'm going to lie, cheat, steal, and manipulate even more because I'm an alcoholic, and that's how I think. And the, and the 12 and 12 tells me, when I'm, when I'm sad, I, I can't just be sad. I'm going to be depressed to the ends of the earth. I'm not just going to be happy. I'm going to be overjoyed. And the seventh step tells me that I give all of me to God, good and bad. I don't get to pick what parts of me are good, and I don't get pick, pick what parts of me are bad. You know, when I say that seven-step prayer every day, and I was at a meeting, and again, I heard a speaker share this. What they do is part of their seventh step, and I would love to tell you that I do this every day, but I don't. And I haven't done it for a couple of weeks because I know what the answer is going to be. But when I'm living right and I'm practicing the principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, I can say, God, please, let people treat me today 
the way I treated them yesterday. And when I can say that, I know I'm living in the third step and I'm practicing the seventh step. My life and me are a bunch of character defects. I know what they are. And sometimes my pride gets in the way of allowing me to ask you for help. But you know what? When I'm hurting, most people know I am an open book and it's out there and I don't do very well covering it up. Am I going through a difficult time right now? Yes. Is it fear? Absolutely. It's a thousand percent fear-based and I know that to the core of my being. But I'm working with you to walk through that. And I know no matter what, I don't have to take a drink over anything that's going on in my life. My God made me, made me, or gave me the ability to be human and to share with you that, you know, I'm not struggling in my sobriety. I'm just going through some stuff that's really uncomfortable. <laughs> and I don't like it. And I don't know how it's going to work out. And that's really it. I don't know what the end result is going to be. You know, so I continue to do six and seven. I continue to do inventories. Um, I still use sex as a weapon and sex as a tool. Ask my husband. He's in the room. <laughs> and I don't know any girl or guy that, that may not. I, I know for me, if there's something that I want from him, I know exactly how to get it. And that's just being honest. I can use it as a weapon and withhold to also get what I want. And I have to look at those things today. Just because I don't have a hundred different partners today, like I did when I was out there drinking, doesn't mean that I still don't use that stuff in my life today to get what I want. And you know what? I'm a really good flirt. Even if I'm not married to you, I can, I can use that as a tool too. And I need to be very conscious of those things today. You know, and I need to look at that and inventory that because I also have a sane idea of what I want my relationship to be with, like my husband. I don't want sex to be a weapon or a tool for me to manipulate other people to get what I want. And I work at that and I give that kind of stuff to God so I don't be like that. You know, so I do have a good, healthy relationship with my husband and he doesn't have to wonder what does she want, you know. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, I just want to make them happy. You know, so thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.